Today's Homeowner with Danny Lifford. Real projects for real homeowners with real solutions. Information and inspiration on improving your home from professional remodeler Danny Lifford. I'm glad you're with us this week. You know, a big part of any home renovation or remodel is selecting the right floor covering. In fact, you can just change the floor covering in a room and it'll completely change the look of that room and the way it functions. The problem is, how do you know what's the right floor covering for your project? Well, this week we'll talk with a number of flooring experts about a few of the things you need to consider when you're selecting your flooring and we'll look at a large assortment of different floor coverings that are available for your home, including a few you've probably never seen. It is a big decision, but before the end of this half hour, we'll give you all the information you need to know to make the right decision. So stay with us. There's just so many different options you have when you're talking about floor covering for your home. It's really kind of hard to really make the decision of exactly what you want in your home. To make it a little easier, we're going to talk with Tom Cook, who's a flooring expert with Armstrong, about a few of the options you have and the very popular laminate flooring. Well, Tom, why do you think that laminate floors have just become so popular? Uh, well, number one, they have great looks, uh -huh. but I think it's durability. It's an amazing product because it's literally like putting the strength of your countertop onto your floor. Right. And, and I like the look. It's very flat and tight. It's very, just very organized, very clean. Makes a great floor. I'm a big fan of it. I know a lot of manufacturers intended on it being a do-it-yourself type of flooring, but um, I'm sure you've seen some of the cases where it didn't quite work out that no, way. No, it was, it was very complicated and, and very messy. Lots of gluing and clamping, and that's all been fixed. And lots of manufacturers today have actually come up with some new, this happens to be one of our products, it's called Armalock, and it's wonderful because you'll notice the, the little tongue and groove. Yeah, it's a lot different than a yep. traditional tongue and groove. And you just put it down, snap it in place. Even I can do it. It's very simple. What, what about the glue in a situation like this? Uh, you can do spot gluing. I see. If it was in a wet situation, like in a bathroom or in front of a dishwasher, mm -hmm. you could just do a little area, but you don't have to do, it's just so clean. And oh, so that makes it a lot oh, easier. It's a dream. <laughs> it now, really is. I think a lot of homeowners relate laminate floors to a wood grain look or simulated wood but uh, really it goes a lot further than that. It does. It's really expanded. They can do wonderful ceramic looks, the looks of stones and marbles. It's a very wide range. Now you've been in the flooring business a long time. You've seen a lot of trends come and go. What are some trends that are out there now that you think maybe will stay around a little while? Well definitely the naturals look. Uh, it's such a big look. Everybody seems to have a bond with the looks of nature and the artists and designers are able to do wonderful interpretations today. It's, it's just growing and getting more sophisticated and better all the time. And so a lot of the stones and a lot oh, of the yeah. marbles and granite looks, that type of thing. Absolutely. We'll see them in a whole variety. And of course, those products exist in their real form and they're available to people, but there are lots of options today. You can go and find another product like vinyl, for example. Well, you actually have to touch it to, to see that it's not the, uh, the real thing. Well, I think that's a, that's a good point, actually. I think the designers and artists have worked so hard, and there's new embossing techniques, mechanical and chemical embossing, so you get that really deep feel of realism. And, of course, the finishes are more matte now. It's a great look. Yeah, it really is. I know um, that it really does look like the stone look that so many people are are really finding that they like in their home. Absolutely. But, uh, there's a lot more styles than this, though. Oh, yeah. We, we alone have over 250. Hmm. So you can imagine throughout the industry, there's a lot of choices. And a lot of um, simulation of uh, ceramic tile, brick. Um, Absolutely. You name it. And I think we have it. We have ceramic, and you mentioned brick. And we have wonderful stones, marbles, slate, field stone. The varieties are really endless, and the designers have a lot of fun interpreting it. Now, a few of our viewers may have had vinyl floors in the past, say in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They pull the refrigerator out to clean behind, end up with kind of a nasty gouge. Is the new technology on this addressing that? Absolutely. In fact, it was created specifically for that problem, and it is so durable now and affordable, which is really, I think, a wonderful quality to have in a product. Yes, yeah, certainly. A lot less expensive to simulate the, the old materials or the natural materials and actually putting in the materials themselves. Absolutely, uh, because those installations can be very 
very time consuming and of course time is money. Right, exactly. Now, now Tom, on this show we've looked at a lot of different types of flooring and some are better in some areas of the house than others. What does a homeowner do in terms of uh, some of the considerations and exactly what type of flooring they need for the remodeling project or the whole home? You no, know, I, I always try to tell people to go for suitability. It should suit your style of your home, the room that it's going to be used in, if it's a kitchen or a bathroom or a children's room. Uh, also, it has to suit your budget. Right. And I think that the very best thing to do is to hone your selections down to two or three wonderful things that are compatible so that you avoid that patchwork look, which is a no-no. One of the most frequent comments I hear from homeowners when they're selecting materials for their home remodeling projects is they'd like to select things with a little bit of character. And when you're talking about flooring, they also have to be durable. And as Tom mentioned earlier, they need to fit in the budget. Well, we're about to look at a unique custom floor that fits that bill. Now, one of the ways that we add character to walkways and driveways on our remodeling projects is to use brick pavers like we've done here. Now, with all the traffic that you have coming in an entryway to the home, if it'll hold up outside, it's bound to do well inside. The problem in using brick, many times it'll be two and a half inches or thicker on the floor. Now, that's too much for most room-to-room -room transitions, but I've got the solution. Now, this floor is a solid brick floor that's only a half inch thick, and all of it made from recycled bricks. Now, one of the guys who's been instrumental in kind of pioneering this whole idea is my friend Paul Emmons. Now, Paul, other parts of the country, they're just not familiar with split brick floors. Tell us a little bit about how it all got started. Well, it got started about 100 years ago when they put whole bricks down. And then when they started splitting these bricks, they got hard to find, so they started splitting them in half. And then that came a problem remodeling because of the doorways and stuff. They'd be too tall. So we started splitting them half inch thick and uh, you install them that way. Okay, now of course the installation is real similar to ceramic installing. In fact, it's exactly like ceramic. You uh, pull your thin set on the floor and you install it just like you would ceramic and you grout it and then you clean it. Okay, now the grouting's a little bit different um, in that you're, it's really not recommended with the thicker joints that we have on the split brick floors to use traditional grout, so you're using something a little different for that. Right, we make our own grout. We use a three to one mixture. It's three parts sand, one part cement. Okay, all right, and then after, of course, I know that you had this grouted just a few days ago, and then this morning, a little bit of a cleaning had to be done to it. Right, we used muriatic acid, a real light solution of muriatic acid, and uh, some doodle bug pads to scrub the floors up real clean with. Okay, all right. Now, of course, that's one of the things you need to be careful anytime you're using muriatic acid uh, anywhere you need to be careful, but particularly inside your home because it can really tarnish any of your hinges and doorknobs and that type of thing. Plus, it's a terrible smell to it. Now, after all of that, then a little bit of drying time before you actually put the sealer on it, and I guess that's one of the differences between the brick and the ceramic. Right. The, the brick, the mortar has to cure in the joints. It takes 30 days for cement to cure. So therefore, you have to wait 30 days before you can put an oil-based finish on it. If mm -hmm. you use a water-based finish, you don't have to wait about 15 days. But with an oil-based finish, it takes 30 days. Okay, and most everybody likes that high-gloss finish to it. Right, and it usually takes about four days. You know, you put a four coats uh -huh. on the floor. Okay, all right. Well, I know one of the things that homeowners like is the variety of color in it because you can have, you know, a few of the black ones in here, and then you can have more of the buff kind of pink-colored and... Uh, and then, of course, you have some complaints from some people thinking that you've splattered paint all over it. That's part of the character of it. Right. That's the oyster shells. They used anything they could find to throw in the uh, mix when they were making these bricks. And they used it for fill, and it was just anything they could find. Rocks, oyster shells, just anything. Mm -hmm. And cost is about the same as um, a midline uh, ceramic, I guess. Right. It's about the same price. Installation, labor, and everything. Okay. That'd be about 6 to $8 per square foot installed. Well, really, it's a, it's a hard floor. It holds up well. Also, if you have a slab that maybe has a few little imperfections, it allows you to kind of even that off in terms of the top of the floor itself. Right. Bricks are not perfect floor. They're more of a rustic type. They're, the grout joints are not perfectly straight, and the floor is not perfectly flat. Okay. All right. Well, it certainly looks good, and I look forward to seeing this one after it's all nice and glossy. Now, we've looked at a lot of different types of floor covering for almost any area of the home, but one of the most popular types around today, ceramic. 
Now one thing about a showroom like this one, you're able to see a lot of the ceramic tile already in place so that you can get a good idea of what it would look like in your home. Now the person that's responsible for all of these great designs, Amy Collier. Now Amy, when homeowners come into your showroom and they're trying to put a little bit of their personality in their home through the ceramic tile installation, how do you get that process started? We start by talking about what they're looking for, what they like, what they've seen. Uh, we talk about their budget, some of the other details that they're using. We love to have floor plans because that tells us uh, the scope of the project and then also time frames and, and things like that. We then move to ideas, any type of an area of, in, of inspiration. If they see something that they like, maybe we pull an element from that photograph and work with that. We then move to actual materials, whether it be for the floor or for the walls, and then we talk about designs, do concepts, and put them down on paper. Yeah, I love the drawings. It really kind of allows the homeowners to visualize exactly what the end result mm -hmm. will be, and I would guess this ends up out on the job to help out the installers. Absolutely. This becomes the client's copy, the showroom copy, and the installation copy so that we can all communicate about that job. Yeah, that's really important. Now, I guess you're considering a few of these designs uh, on this project. We are in several different rooms. We're looking at a couple of different options. This actually is one that we have here in the showroom. Now, Amy, this is real nice. I can see that in a bathroom, kitchen, even a foyer area. Absolutely. This is great for lots of different applications. And as you can see here, there are, it's great for the client to be able to see the way this all comes together, but it is always great to see how it all looks all put together with all of the elements building to create a space. And I guess the same approach you use on a design like this, you use the same on designing different floors. Here I, I see a little glaze and a little matte finish all mixed together. That's right. We've used multiple materials, both with the glossy ceramic and then we've used a matte finish porcelain using basic materials to create kind of a different pattern. Okay, all right. This one over here really seems like that would take some time with all the individual pieces you have in that pattern. This is a custom design, so this was hand created both with slate and with biblical stone in the mosaics. However, because even though this was a little more detailed to install, we have lots of other options as well. All right, this seems like this one would take a long time too with all the little pieces, even what, glass in there, huh? This particular one, we've cut a couple of corners. Part of the border comes already mounted together. It's got a plastic sheeting on the front. All of the pieces with their thickness variations are mounted so that when they're placed into the mud bed or the thin set, they're all level. After everything is dry prior to grouting, the adhesive is removed and then all cleaned up and grouted. Well, it sure seems like that would save a lot of time. Now, how else can you use this kind of approach in other designs that are popular? We have lots of things that are coming back now. Mosaics are very big, both in basket weaves, which is very classical, using some very classical colors. Mm -hmm. We have an, a new interpretation on the basket weave called a wicker pattern that's mm -hmm. just kind of a little different and, and very beautiful when it's all installed. And we also have another product that are individual shapes, be it contemporary shapes or traditional shapes, that are also mesh mounted and therefore easy to install. I see. That sounds great. That's where that real personality can come out in the floor. Absolutely. Now, a lot of homeowners and viewers ask us all the time, you know, what's hot? What are the new trends? How would you answer that in the world of ceramic and hard surfaces? I have just the thing. And customers just love this floor. This has lots of things that are new. We've got the polished slate, which is a material that we haven't had before. The surface itself is perfectly smooth, but if you look into the, each individual piece, you still see the graining and the surface variation, so it gives it this visual texture. To that material, we've added metal dots in several different shapes, so we've used a basic material, added some really great accents, and for a great floor. It is a beautiful floor and really a beautiful showroom, and this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Well, I hope we've been able to provide you some great information that you can use the next time you're trying to select that perfect flooring for your home. You can tell there's a lot out there to choose from, so take your time, do your homework, and talk to a few friends and neighbors about what they would recommend. It's a big choice, so shop smart. Until next time, I'm Danny Lifford. Get ready to review your fix-it list as Danny and home repair expert Joe Truini show you this week's simple solution. Many projects you may do around your home need to be done from a ladder. Now we've shown you here on Simple Solutions a number of ways to really efficiently work off a ladder and to do it safely. Joe has a couple more ideas. How you doing, Joe? Good, Danny. How you doing today? Good. Great. We're just working on this gutter here, but I wanted to show you a couple more simple solutions regarding working from a ladder okay. make it a lot easier to work. Whenever you're doing a job where there's lots of parts, screws and bolts and little nails and things, 
if you put them on top of the ladder and then move the ladder, you know, they invariably fall over the floor. So this tip requires you to just get a small metal can. This has to be a tuna fish can, not aluminum, it has to be metal. And I just put in a couple of these little, wa little uh, magnets. They mm -hmm. stick right to the bottom of the can. Then you, when you drop your screws and nuts in there, you know, they don't go anywhere. They stick right to the magnet. Well, that's great, especially small screws and small nuts and washers, just like you would have with a gutter or working with a ceiling fan, something like that. Right. Inevitably, they're going to end up all over the floor. And all I did is just took the can and just duct taped it right to the top of the ladder, and then you can easily take it off. Okay. Now, the second one I wanted to show you is for holding hand tools. And all I did is I just took a plastic cup, you know, there's lots of these all around, and I just ran a screw through the cup and into the side of the ladder. Now, most ladders have holes in the top, but for larger items, you know, they just can't fit in, and it's easier just to drop them right into the cup. Now, I notice you didn't tighten the cup. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, well, the nice thing about not tightening it is when you move the ladder and you pull it out of plumb, you know, the cup will, will swivel and the tools won't come spilling out. And I guess you could put several of these around on each side of the ladder if you wanted to. Absolutely. That's a great tip. Now let's join Danny at the Home Center to check out the best new products. Now if you're in the market for a cordless drill, you may be surprised as to how many there are available. But I found one that has a few features that will really be useful for homeowners. It's the Ryobi Home Project Cordless Drill Driver. Now this particular one is an 18 volt. It's also available in 14.4 volt and 12 volt. Let me show you the 14.4. Now, it comes with a carrying case, which is nice and convenient. Then you have the drill driver, the charger, and an extra battery. Now, this has several features that a lot of cordless drills have, um, including the nice grip that's ergonomically correct. You have the keyless chuck that's real popular, and you have the clutch setting. This particular one has 24 different clutch settings, but here's where it's a little different. Now, it has a level, but actually it has two levels one on the back and one on the top. Also, it has the little clips on each side to hold your little driver bits. But if you're hanging a picture or a mirror, you can slip this right off and you have your little small level that you can put right up on the wall to get everything nice and level. I think it's a great little addition to this tool and then slips right back on. Also, if you're tired of fumbling around with screws when you're using a drill driver, this one has a little magnetic tray right there that will hold your screws. No more fumbling around on the ground trying to find the screws that you need to complete your job. Now, the nice thing about it, you get everything you have here from Ryobi for less than $90. Now let's go outside for Around the Yard with Danny and lawn and garden expert Barbara Katz. So sometimes the simplest things in the garden are actually the easiest things to do wrong, like just knowing how to plant a plant correctly. I've made a few mistakes here. When I first started planting some plants, I would plant them too low, I would pile dirt up around them, <laughs> pretty much everything you're not supposed to do. Danny, do you have any idea why that would not be good for a plant? Now I do. I didn't then. Well, the whole reason is because when you've got a plant growing in a pot and it's either come from a nursery or a grower. It sent out its feeder roots right at the top of the pot. So when you put that back in the ground, you've got to keep those feeder roots at the same level that they've grown accustomed to. Now I've added a little humus here in the bottom of the hole that we dug, fairly good sized hole. That's great. I like the humus. It makes all the difference to the way the plant can take off. We're going to put that around there. And then we take a mixture of that humus and the soil. You want to really pack it back in around the plant because what can happen, depending on where you live in the country, is sometimes if you've got frost in the wintertime, the plant will heave. But the better you've planted it and packed the soil around it, the less that's going to happen. And I see the professional landscapers always creating this little moat all the way around it, and that's for? That is to keep the water in when you first start up watering this because if you don't give something to protect it, and contain that water, it's just going to run off and then your plant's going to be thirsty.